Hey everyone, it's Saoirse, and today we're going to continue with Dune by talking about Dune Messiah, which is the second book in the series. This is written by Frank Herbert and published in 1969. So it's a lot shorter than the first one, as you can see, and it resulted in, in me feeling like I had just picked it up, started reading it, was getting into it, and then it was just over. It was so fast, um, but weirdly gripping because this is this is a like political drama let's just say that and I had heard people talk about that and how it might not be that interesting to people who aren't into politics but this is not current politics this is thousands and thousands of years in the future somewhere in space so way more interesting than you know current affairs because it's fake so I didn't mind that most of this book is not about action, it's more about scheming. It's a lot about scheming. Everybody's scheming to bring Paul down. So I'll read you the back here. Dune Messiah continues the story of Paul Atreides, better known and feared as the man christened Muad'Dib. As emperor of the known universe, he possesses more power than a single man was ever meant to wield. Worshipped as a religious icon by the fanatical Fremen, Paul faces the enmity of the political houses he displaced when he assumed the throne, and a conspiracy conspiracy conducted within his own sphere of influence. And even as House Atreides begins to crumble around him from the machinations of his enemies, the true threat to Paul comes to his lover Chani and the unborn heir to his family's dynasty. So it gets a little bit um, spoilery even on the back. And I will talk about spoilers. There's a mosquito in here. I'm so tired of this. I'm so tired of it. It's it's literally December now. Like, I just wish they would all go away. Okay. So, yeah, we will get into some spoilers. So, political drama mixed with a lot of mysticism. So, everything that Paul was going through in the first book with the uh, the terrible purpose and the visions that he was having of what was going to happen if he continued to lead people. Um, he knew it was not going to be good. And we get kind of taken along on Paul's um, mystic journey throughout this entire book. Like, the whole book is him thinking um, about all the different paths that are branching out that he could take, but he can't really because there's only one thing that he can do. So the whole time you're just wondering, well, what is it? What are you going to do? Um, and I really enjoyed it. So I'll just read the first the first little bit here in the book. It comes well the book starts with this Q and A thing, which is kind of interesting. Um, and it lets us know that it's it's been years since the first book, I think like a decade or so. Um, but then this here it tells us a, a little bit of a what am I trying to say? Like a recap pretty much you know, a previously on type thing. So it says, um, Muad'Dib's imperial reign generated more historians than any other era in human history. Most of them argued a particular viewpoint, jealous and sectarian, but it says something about the peculiar impact of this man that he aroused such passions on so many diverse worlds. Of course, he contained the ingredients of history, ideal and idealized. This man, born Paul Atreides in an ancient great family, received the deep prana bindu training from the Lady Jessica, his Bene Gesserit mother, and had through this a superb control over muscles and nerves. But more than that, he was a mentat, an intellect whose capacities surpassed those of the religiously prescribed mechanical computers used by the ancients. Above all else, Muad'Dib was the Kwisatz Haderach, which the Sisterhood's breeding program had sought across thousands of generations. The Kwisatz Haderach then the one who could be many places at once, this prophet, this man through whom the Bene Gesserit hoped to control human destiny, this man became Emperor Muad'Dib and executed a marriage of convenience with the daughter of the Padishah Emperor he had defeated. Um, and that's a reference to how he marries Princess Irulan. I, let's just say, at the end of the last book, I was really hoping that was not going to happen. I was hoping he'd be like, kidding, I'm not really going to marry somebody other than the woman I love just for political gain. Whatever, it sucked. Um, and then... 
He, he brought the spacing guild to its knees and placed his own sister Aaliyah on the religious throne the Bene Gesserit had thought their own. He did all these things and more. Um, Mwadib's, I don't know how to say some of these words, Kizarat missionaries carried their religious war across space in a jihad whose major impetus endured only 12 standard years. But in that time, religious colonialism brought all but a fraction of the human universe under one rule. So, again, a lot about religion, a lot about colonizing, a lot about the dangers of these things. Um, and it seems like I had expected that Paul was just going to be um, a raging douchebag throughout this book, from what I'd heard, but it was more like it's subtle than that. You know, he was heading towards something and the whole time fighting against it, but you can see the way he subtly uses people along the way, um, because, and like doesn't divulge information even though he knows it, you know, he can pretty much see the future, and he's not, he's not being straightforward or forthcoming to people who might need to know things, such as, um, Chani. So. I'll just read a few bits in here that I think kind of point at the, the theme, the, the point that the author's trying to make with this book. Because I've heard that this, like, he had to write this as a bridge to get to the next book, but um, I haven't read the next book yet, so I'm excited. The Fremen are civil, educated, and ignorant. And this is this character, I don't know how to say this name, Saital? It's S-C-Y-T-A-L-E. Um, Saital said, they're not mad, they're trained to believe, not to know. Belief can be manipulated, only knowledge is dangerous. So, there you go, obvious point. Um, keeping the Fremen religious, keeping them, and anybody worshipping Paul as a messiah is going to result in being able to control those people. As soon as they have the knowledge that he is not a hero, that's when things get dangerous for him. Um, but then we see Paul here thinking, I never wanted to be a god. I wanted only to disappear like a jewel of trace dew caught by the morning. I wanted to escape the angels and the damned alone, as though by an oversight. This boy does a lot of brooding, and um, he's got a lot of angst. And that's okay. It's, um... I don't know if it's... It might be, like, repetitive for some people, but I found the way that the narrative kept going in this sort of... I don't know, just had this bad feeling the whole time. We'll get to that. So Paul wrestles a lot with, with knowing that he's done a bad thing, and I'm still not quite understanding why he had to do... Why did he have to do all of this? Um, because he's now completely changed the ecology of Arrakis and is trying to grow things there. Things are growing there. Um, and here it says, He thought of the water cellars, their way destroyed by the lavish dispensing from his hands. They hated him. He'd slain the past. And there were others, even those who'd fought for the souls to buy precious water, who hated him for changing the old ways. As the ecological pattern dictated by, by Muad'Dib remade the planet's landscape, human resistance increased. Was it not presumptuous, he wondered, to think he could make over an entire planet, everything growing where and how he told it to grow? Even if he succeeded, what of the universe waiting out there? Did it fear similar treatment? So... Yeah, I think he is realizing the consequences of his actions, but at the same time always knew what those consequences were going to be. Um, and then this is the author telling us, you can't go in and, and steal somebody's homeland and make it your own, and then expect everything 
to be great because it won't. Um, and this is one of those little like, we still get those fun things at the beginning of the chapters. Empires do not suffer emptiness of purpose at the time of their creation. It is when they have become established that aims are lost and replaced by vague ritual. So yeah, when a new, um, I think of like cults, kind of like, I definitely think of, of Paul's followers um, as being sort of in a cult. And you know, when cults start out, everything's so exciting. Caddy's right here. She took my chair, so I sat on a different chair, and now she's now she's back on the chair. She's so pretty. Um, yeah, when cults start out, everybody's excited, everybody's having a great time, like, we're gonna change the world, we're gonna... whatever, it's a cult. And then... <clears throat> like, you, you feel like you've got this purpose, and there's a reason why you're doing all these nuts things. But then once you've been in it for a while, you know, once Paul has been in control for a while, people start to forget why they are, why they are keeping all these weird rituals and not questioning it after so many years. Now this is an interesting um, point about the danger of religion or, or why religion even exists. Some say that people cling to imperial leadership because space is infinite. They feel lonely without a unifying symbol. For a lonely people, the emperor is a definite place. They can turn toward him and say, See, there he is. He makes us one. Perhaps religion serves the same purpose, my lord. And that was that character whose name I can't say again. So, yeah. Religion is this unifier against fear. It's a unifier against this horror that the the universe is just massive and uncaring and we are small little cockroaches and so if we have I, and again I don't even think it needs to be religion it can be a cult although of course there are a lot of religious cults but anywhere where you have a leader government um, where you can have corrupt leaders all the time as long as you have somebody to be like look at me, um, all of you down there, look at me, and I will tell everyone what to do and it'll be okay and we don't need to focus on the fear and whatever else you were thinking about before I was in power. Um, just focus on this right now and it'll be great. It's so dangerous. And you can feel everything's just spiraling in here. Okay, this is the last... This is the last thing I'll read from the book directly. The audacious nature of Muad'Dib's actions may be seen in the fact that he knew from the beginning whither he was bound, yet not once did he step aside from that path. He put it clearly when he said, I tell you that I come now to my time of testing when it will be shown that I am the ultimate servant. Thus he weaves all into one, that both friend and foe may worship him. It is for this reason and this reason only that his apostles prayed, Lord, save us from the other paths which Muad'Dib covered with the waters of his life. Those other paths may be imagined only with the deepest revulsion. So, spoilers. Spoilers coming. Um, throughout the whole book, it's like we feel like we know what's coming because he keeps going on and on about this, like, eventuality that he can't avoid. Um, but at the same time, he's not telling us what it is. So one of the big things in this book that is whack and um, would have been more of a surprise if I hadn't started to read the introduction. Never, never read the introduction until you're done because why do they exist to spoil the book that you're about to read? So there's the whole fact that Duncan Idaho comes back as a Gola, which is like dead flesh reanimated and doesn't have the memories of the original person, um, but he eventually manages to get his memories back through his relationship with Paul, I guess. And that was nuts because I called it, like, in the first book, and I know I'm decades behind everybody who's read these before, but in the first book I was like, Duncan Idaho cannot be gone for good. He just can't. He can't. He's too cool. Um, and then I saw the movie and I was like, are they really gonna cast Jason Momoa just to die and, and not like come back at some point 
So if they do make the second movie, we'll get to see him again. Um, it was very much a bummer that the Gola is what he is, like dead flesh. Um, and Paul knows the whole time that he's been sent there to destroy him. He's sent by the conspirators against him, one of which is his wife, um, which I don't blame her because, oh, he's awful to her. He's awful to her. But at the same time, I don't like her because she's not Chani and I feel bad for Chani. It's such a mess. It is such a mess. Um, but like you want Duncan and Paul to have this relationship that they used to have, but at the same time, he's dead, and it's weird. Um, there's a lot of weird stuff in here. There's, like, a part where it's suggested that some incest happens, because, like, Paul should have a kid with his sister to carry on the line, which, thank goodness, that was not discussed much further, because that was really gross. Um... Yeah, but this Duncan, this Duncan character, he kind of carried the whole book. It was a little weird that he had, like, a romance with Aaliyah. She's real, she's real young, like, she's, I think, 15, almost 16. That was odd. Um, but I will say, like, the biggest blind sides come right at the end. Ugh, I didn't mean to make a pun there, but Paul loses his sight. Literally, there's, like, like, you think everything is on track, he's, he's in his crazy mode where he's like, I know what is going to happen, and everything is on the path, like, the course is proceeding as I saw it, and then, boom, there's, like, this explosion thing, and he loses his eyes. I had to go back and be like, what, excuse me? Um, but he could still, for a while, like, see with his inner vision, um, which was whack and scared a lot of people and I thought okay that's the craziest thing that's gonna happen right like is he gonna spend the rest of these books blind then Chani dies having twins I'm like we barely even got to see this girl like she was hardly in any of it she her part was so small compared to like what I thought it should be or what I thought it was um, so yeah, dead, that's crazy, and then that snaps the Gola, and he tries to kill Paul, but then comes back from it, and yay, we have, like, semi-real sort of dead Duncan Idaho back, which is nice, I guess, um, because then the craziest thing happens where Paul just kind of dips out and walks into the desert, and we're to assume that he's he's done. Goodbye. Like, he's probably gonna die out there. Now, I'm pretty sure we're gonna see him again one way or another, because how could there be so many more books and, he, and he's gone? Like, I'm guessing his children and his sister will be... the next book is called Children of Dune. His children will be, like, the main part of the next book, and his sister will be, um, but Paul and Chani just... The, the main characters, goodbye, like, what? So, I'm in shock, um, I don't know what to think. I, do not give me any spoilers for the next books, or I'll be very unhappy. Um, I'm dodging enough spoilers as it is with the damn introductions. But yeah, that's, that is all I'm thinking right now. I, my brain is going bananas, um, because I, I just, honestly, like, I read that and I was like, is this, did I pick up a copy of a book that, like, has the cover that says Dune Messiah, but somebody just, like, fanfic wrote all of this? Because how could everybody be dead and, and we have a weird, um, Duncan Idaho zombie? Didn't expect anything to turn out that way. What are your thoughts on this second book? Is, like, did you like it? I really liked it, and I, I don't know, I don't know how to explain, like, why... I really enjoyed it. It just seemed to move, like, I don't know what it is about his writing. It just goes with this flow that is like, I don't really know what these people are talking about with the political stuff and the conspiracy, but I'm right there in it and it's moving me along and yeah, I liked it. So I will keep reading them. I already have the next book. Anyway, that is it for right now and I will see you all next time. Thanks for watching.